them have a 20 minutes presentation, they will give us a three different perspective of the use of the hyaluronic acid. And uh, in other words, thanks to them, in uh, one and a half hour time, we are going to jump to the future. The hyaluronic acid has been utilized in various disciplines in medicine due to its presence in the connective tissue and due to its biocompatibility. And more recently also it has shown positive effects in our field in the non-surgical, surgical periodontal therapy. Therefore the goal of this session is to provide an overview of the <coughs> biological effect and also on the clinical effect on paleo treatment. The first speaker will be uh, Rick Myron, and the title of his presentation is Biological Effect of Hyaluronic Acid on Tissue Regeneration. Dr. Richard Myron currently resides in Florida, United States, and works as a visiting faculty in the Department of Pedontology in our university in Bern, Switzerland, where he completed his PhD studies since 2009. He has currently published over 150 peer-reviewed articles and lectures internationally on many topics related to the growth factors, bone biomaterials, and guided tissue regeneration. He has recently been awarded many prizes in regenerative implant dentistry, including the ITI Andre Schroeder Prize and the IADAIR Young Investigator of the Year in the field of implant dentistry. His lab focuses in the use of various biomaterials utilized for tissue regeneration, and today his lecture will focus on the prominent role of hyaluronic acid and its effect on cell and periodontal tissue. Rick, please, the stage is yours. It's great being here. I actually took an overnight flight last night and landed about two hours ago uh, <laughs> here in Europe, so I'm a little bit jet lagged, but I'm super excited about presenting this topic because um, I always say that biologic and biological materials are the future of, of medicine and especially dentistry without question. Uh, we're a little bit behind in dentistry, I always say this. So if you look at medical fields, they use a lot of growth factors and a lot of biological agents. In dentistry, we're a little bit behind, and this is a nice topic. Uh, very, very thrilled to, to show some of the data that we've done. Now this is something that was asked of us uh, to just show. So of course, we've received some research money um, from Regadent to do some of these studies. Uh, majority of these were conducted at the University of Bern uh, while I was there. So. Just to go over who I am, who our group is, what we do. Um, so I'm actually Canadian. I was born in Canada and raised there. And I'm a little bit different than most dentists in this room because I actually did 10 years of university in molecular and cell biology. Once that was completed, then I went back to dental school. Um, I did a lot of my training in, in Bern, Switzerland, of course. I've been there working with uh, Dr. Schoolian. This is our group uh, at the University of Bern. Um, I went back as head of cell biology, so I'm a cell biologist by training and I did most of my work there, and I'll show you some of the results. I have to give a lot of credit to the entire team. Of course, it's not just me that stands behind here. Dr. Schoolian has been incredible and one of the leaders in periodontology. Uh, Dr. Bozart has done a lot of the work with histology. Dr. Bo Boozer, of course, is well known in implant dentistry. And of course, I have to give a lot of thanks to this man right here, Reinhard Gruber, who did a lot of uh, preclinical work with our group in cell biology and kind of set up the lab for me. Uh, this is head of research right here in Canada, and Yufeng Zhang is one of the collaborators, and you'll see his name on, on a lot of these publications. Now recently, I was asked to do this really cool project with Quintessence, and it kind of put us into perspective. You know, there's so many biomaterials out there right now. Uh, there's so many graphing materials, so many membranes, and Quintessence approached me, and the whole concept here was to try and gather all this data, write a textbook on biomaterials, and figure out where and when you should use which materials. Part of this process also was, what are the standards today? What materials should we be using today? And what are the kind of next generation materials? And that's kind of what I'll be presenting today. And so there's, you know, I thought about doing a cute way of putting 
different people or little pictures. There's just a huge amount of people that have contributed to the field of biomaterials. Of course, I bolded all the European colleagues that have worked here. I have to really thank a lot of them also for some of this work. Now, when we look at kind of standard materials that we're using today, uh, of course, bone grafts, everybody knows these classifications. Uh, same thing with barrier membranes. We have non-resorbable ones, resorbable, titanium, etc. And of course, growth factors. And I always say, you know, this is the future. In the United States, we use a lot of PDGF and a lot of BMP2, which is not used here in Europe. Uh, in Europe, you guys are more using endogain. Now, when we talk about next generation, the whole concept here is, what are materials that are going to be available in the future to us? And what Quintessons wanted to do was they said, okay, you know, Dr. Myron, since you're young, you know, write the book today. What are the standards? What are the next generation materials? Five years from now, the hope is see which one of these next generation materials will kind of be the standard today, and then write an updated book with new next generation materials. And one trend that we found here is that actually when we were doing all this research, most of the next generation topics were related to biological materials, okay? So a lot of research and a lot of groups are working on different materials. Of course, today I'm gonna to be focused on hyaluronic acid. So question, what is hyaluronic acid, right? What is it? And where is it found in the human body? So here's some key facts. Of course, we've known since the 30s uh, that it's been identified in connective tissues. Primarily, it's found in connective tissue, epithelial tissue. Um, it's unique uh, in, in that it's non-sulfated. Uh, but anyways, this is what a hyaluronic acid molecule looks like. And these can basically gather and make big chains, small chains. And I'll talk more about high molecular weight hyaluronic acid versus low molecular weight uh, hyaluronic acid. Now, it's very important during wound healing and scar formation. Okay? And this is a key concept that I want to really present here because when you see some of the surgeries by some of the clinicians uh, that are going to show their clinical cases, you'll see when it comes to scar formation and wound healing, the results here are really fantastic. So hyaluronic acid, where is it found? Well, all these areas, people have been studying in medicine, and as I mentioned, we're always a little bit behind in dentistry. So in medicine, they've actually been using it since the 70s and 80s okay, for a lot of different procedures. It was first used uh, for eye type surgeries, cataract, etc. And you'll notice that a lot of these names, they are, they're a little bit play on words with the term hyaluronic acid. So here, helon, right, for hyaluronic acid, or you have hyalin here for uh, hyaluronic acid is also called uh, hyaluronin, so hyalin. Of course, hyadent now, hyaluronic acid for dentistry, hyadent is the product here. So you'll see uh, in the literature, if you look up hyaluronic acid, a lot of these naming systems are based on the fact that it contains hyaluronic acid. Now there's two things you should know. So you can use high molecular weight hyaluronic acid and you can use low molecular weight hyaluronic acid. And they both have different roles. Basically in the body, we have a lot of high molecular weight hyaluronic acid. When this gets, when this gets broken down, it makes low molecular weight hyaluronic acid and this causes inflammation. So everything that we work with in tissue regeneration, and of course the products that we're doing research with, are always high molecular weight hyaluronic acid. This is what we want to focus on here. So today, what are the major uses in, in high, for hyaluronic acid? Of course, there's two main fields here. So first one here is, of course, in uh, cosmetic uh, surgery or cosmetic. You can use it as cream, as inject in, injections. And it's funny, when I talk to some of the clinicians now, I was just speaking to some of them, and it's funny, you know, you say to a, a female, especially 30-year-old, you're going to do treatment with hyaluronic acid, and they all get all excited because they're using hyaluronic acid, right? <laughs> so it's just to say, you know, hyaluronic acid is very common. Uh, people know about it, but again, why is it effective in those fields? Because it's found in connective tissue. So, of course, if you're going to regenerate soft tissues of skin, very similar to gingival tissues. Very, very prominent, and a lot of research being ongoing uh, in the osteoarthritis field. Uh, I actually personally do research in cartilage regeneration also, and we're working with hyaluronic acid here in different combinations here. So next, when was this expressed in periodontal tissues? Well, 1995, okay? So of course, periodontal tissues contain connective tissue, right? It just makes sense. You'll find two publications here. If anybody wants them, uh, you can send me an email. I have my email address at the end. I'm more than happy to share any of this data with you guys. But around the year 2000, hyaluronic acid was uh, started being researched for its potential role in periodontal wound healing, okay? And the other thing that I always say too is that when it comes to regenerative agents, you will not believe how long it takes from when a researcher discovers a new molecule that might work in tissue regeneration to how long it actually gets to clinics, okay? It takes years and years, and it's just to show you that since 2002, people have been doing research on this field here. So again, there's two different formulations, okay? There's a non-cross-linked type of HA and there's a cross-linked type of HA, OK? 
okay? And you'll see this with the companies if you ever uh, go to their booth, and I recommend it. You'll see the liquid version, which is non-crosslinked, and then the crosslinked version. I personally like the crosslinked version, and I'll explain why uh, in some of my slides. But the reason why I like it is because it actually, uh, it's more of a gel, and it actually hardens a little bit. So it's great if you want to treat different types of defects, for example, periodontal defect, where it actually uh, can en encapsulate, and it also helps with blood clot. Uh, formation, so it helps with clotting. Okay, a lot of research since 2004 here, highly rowan and properties for tissue regeneration. Uh, everybody, a lot of people are doing work with this cross-linking formula, okay? Um, so I'm gonna recommend using this. Now, we've done a lot of research uh, on these topics, uh, both in Bern University and also when I went back to Florida. And one of the key things that was really great about working in Bern, Switzerland, of course, was I got to work with a lot of leading clinicians, and of course, Dr. Schooling will present later. And we get to work in combination with a lot of these products. So, you know, we can work at the same time and say, what are you seeing in clinics? What are you seeing in animal models? What are you seeing in cell cultures? And then you can kind of create stories based on what you see. And as I mentioned before, look at this defect that's been treated by Dr. Schooling here. Okay, he's gonna talk about the surgeries that he does, et cetera. But for me, my biological point of view, look at the scar formation here, right? Look at how excellent this wound healing is, right? And this is one of the properties of hyaluronic acid. And he'll talk more about how he performs some of these surgeries. Now we did a lot of work in vitro, so we were looking at you know, how much are these cells, periodontal ligament cells, soft tissue cells, how much are they being upregulated, what's going on with different genes. Um, so I'll show some of the data. Just to explain these graphs here, so here's control, here's hyaluronic acid, the NCL stands for non-crosslink, non-crosslink, these are different concentrations, so if I dilute it 1 to 100, 1 to 10, here's hyaluronic acid that's crosslinked, okay? So you'll see one thing in common. It doesn't matter if it's cross-linked or not. It's still bioactive, okay? So everything when I talk about having the molecule being cross-linked, it's gonna help you later on in clinics, and I'll explain why. The degradation properties of a cross-linked hyaluronic acid are much, much longer, okay? So when it's being cross-linked, basically the hyaluronic acid, which I consider like a bioactive agent, lasts longer and it's not being degraded very, very fast. But it's not to say that if you use, you know, hyaluronic acid in a liquid formulation, it's still very bioactive, right? Exactly the same. Okay, so conclusions here, both are bioactive, and then you can utilize according to the clinical indications here. I'm sure the clinicians will talk more about that. Now, there's been a little bit of a debate, too, on whether or not hyaluronic acid helps with bone formation. Okay, and we've done different studies here, too. And it was interesting, some of the results. So here, if you go without ODM, this stands for osteogenic differentiation media. So we, as a cell biologist, we can actually create media that stimulates kind of a bone environment. Uh, this is without it, and this is with it. So if you take hyaluronic acid alone and you apply it to PDL cells, what happens? They make a whole bunch of soft tissue, okay? They regenerate PDL essentially. It does not really transform them into bone. But if you place it in this osteogenic differentiation media, then it really helps stimulate bone. And one of the things that we notice here is that actually some of these uh, increases are quite huge, up to 20-fold increases, okay? So it's really uh, encouraging the properties that you can get from these hyaluronic acid properties. Now, after we did that first study, just to kind of characterize, you know, what's going on, we want to simulate more clinic, and we did the second study here where we actually looked on dentin surfaces. And I remember being in Bern University, and we had uh, over 100 samples, and I remember going downstairs in Bern, and I said, look, I need 100 discs that are fabricated from human dentin. And the, and the lab techs were like, are you crazy, Dr. Ryan? I'm like, I absolutely need this. Um, but what we did is we actually take human teeth, and we got the technicians to slice them. So this is exactly a dentin slice. Uh, it's smooth, polished, exactly like you would see uh, in clinics. And then what we can do is we can grow up cells on these different dentin discs. We can grow cells with, without hyaluronic acid. And so we did this study also on this dentin slice. And again, this is what a control surface looks like. So this is pure dentin. This is the hyaluronic acid, so it's not really changing too much the surface, but the proteins are definitely there. And this is the cross-linking one. And this is the one that I like using. What you see in the cross-link here is that you actually see a little bit of a coat, and it actually hardens. Okay? And I always imagine myself working as a clinician, right? When you're putting this stuff in a, in a pocket or on a soft tissue or wherever you're using it, it actually forms a layer and it actually kind of shields it, okay? And it hardens within a, a matter of a few, few seconds. Um, in terms of its biocompatibility properties, we can do these live dead assays. So cells, we basically grow them up on the dentin slices and all the cells that are alive and happy, fluoresce green, all the cells that are dying, fluoresce red. Um, you can see here hyaluronic acid is extremely biocompatible. Okay. If I did the same study with PDGF or high concentrations of BMPs, what happens? Cells start to die. Okay.
Okay, so very, very biocompatible material, and it just makes sense. We have hyaluronic acid already in our own in our own tissues, right? Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about future research and kind of what we're working on right now. Um, I personally like hyaluronic acid a lot for the fact that it can contain growth factors. As I mentioned earlier, I think growth factors are the future of every type of tissue regeneration. And the nice thing about the cross-linking version is that you can actually take it and load it with different growth factors. And this can be whatever you want. This can be things like BMPs, which we do a lot in North America. It can be things like PDGF, it can be things like endogain. And I think for those that are involved in research and are academics, there's a huge potential here for future research and a lot of clinical studies that can be done there. Combinations with PRF, I'll show some cases here where uh, we've kind of combined it with PRF too and we get great results there. And we can also combine it obviously with bone grafting materials and barrier membranes uh, as needed. So it's, it's like a little booster, right? It's helping with tissue regeneration so you can easily combine it with bone grafts or membranes. And I'll talk very briefly about one study that we've done here. Okay, first study. What we did here was we combined it with uh, BMPs, right? So as I mentioned in North America, very highly utilized. We took hyaluronic acid. This is the gel-based scaffold that forms its cross-linked. Okay, so we use the cross-link and I'll show why we use it. And we use it as a potential carrier for growth factors here. So here's hyaluronic acid on just a glass dish. Look at this. What's cool about this is that you can actually take it. It's liquid, right? You can mix it with whatever growth factor you want and then it hardens, okay? So imagine this, and I think Personally, in the periodontal field, a lot of people can actually use hyaluronic acid and probably mix it with antibiotics. It hasn't been done yet, but you can probably take it, mix it with antibiotics, right? Put it in a periodontal pocket, put it around an implant, etc. This is all kind of future research that we're kind of looking into, and I think a lot of people would be uh, pleased with some of the results because the results that we got with combining with BMPs are really, really fantastic here. Um, so some of the results and some of the benefits of it, we can look at the BMP9 and how it's released over time. Most growth factors have a very short half-life in the question of minutes. So within minutes, these things are completely gone, degraded. If you load it with a carrier system that's cross-linked, like hyaluronic acid, the advantage here is that as we're looking at this BMP that's being degraded, it's still there 10 days later. Okay, so the hyaluronic acid is basically protecting it, and as the hyaluronic acid breaks down, right, what it's doing is it's actually releasing the BMP, so we get a long-term uh, stimulation with our growth factors. The same thing, theoretically could be observed with antibiotics. And that's why I think, you know, in the future, I'll probably do a little bit more research in that field there too. Here's the data from uh, the BMP studies here. So here's just uh, without any type of growth factor or no hyaluronic acid, uh, we get more staining with the cells here. Uh, this is just representative of osteogenic differentiation. When we use HA, you can see here, of course, it's inducing uh, bone differentiation. When we combine it, of course, with the BMPs, we get even more. So again, hyaluronic acid does have some ability to stimulate bone regeneration. Um, and again, more importantly for, for my group, you can actually combine it with different growth factors and do a lot of really cool and interesting things there. Um, so again, this is an area of future research that I think a lot of people should key into. Second, um, PRF. So we've done a lot of work, my group personally, uh, with PRF and playing with fiber and of course, for those that don't know what this is, you're drawing out blood, of course you're spinning it down. You got two forms, right? You can make a membrane nowadays, but you can also make this liquid formulation if you use uh, slower centrifugation speeds. Now here what you can do is you can actually take this liquid, mix it with the other hyaluronic acid liquid, mix them together, um, and, and use it for tissue regeneration. So here's just an example of doing this. So this is kind of the, the steps that we're doing right now where we're mixing hyaluronic acid with different types of PRF. Um, testing this for, for tissue regeneration and, and uh, ongoing future research. I don't have too many results left. Lastly, of course, hyaluronic acid can be combined with bone grafts and barrier membranes. Uh, we've had one study that was done at the University of Bern uh, with respect to diabetics. Okay? So again, here it makes logical sense. If you're going to have a factor that's going to improve wound healing, where do you want to use this primarily? Well, people that have deficiencies in wound healing. Examples, diabetics, smokers, right? osteoporotic patients, right? And these patients are, you know, increasing on and on. And I think, at least for hyaluronic acid, because in the literature you see a lot of medicine use of hyaluronic acid for diabetics, we can also do this in dentistry too. So this will be a clear-cut indication on the future when some of these papers are published. So I'm just going to go over a couple of conclusions here. Um, HA has several roles. So of course, during hemostasis, uh, it binds to fibrinogen and stabilizes the blood clot. And I'm sure Dr. Schoolian is going to talk about this, right? When you work with this product, one of the advantages, especially with the cross-linking one, 
is that it's actually going to stabilize the blood clot, which is, of course, very important for tissue regeneration. Um, second, it, it plays a role in inflammation, of course, um, by regulating a lot of these crosstalk uh, pathways. More importantly for me, it has more of an effect in the proliferation phase, so in the tissue regeneration phase. Promotes angiogenesis and, and supplies good and adequate blood flow. Has a real effect on cell migration and also proliferation, as some of our studies have shown. Um, and then during the remodeling phase, HA regulates scar formation. Of course, this is extremely clinically relevant, and you'll see some of Dr. Scullion's uh, cases later. Now, for those that want, actually, you know, there's not a lot of literature. I'm going to be quite straightforward. There's not a lot of literature available for HA. We wrote a book chapter with about six different colleagues. If anybody wants that book chapter that's going to be published with Quintessence, I'm more than happy to send you guys just that word file with the, the figures from it. So all you have to do is send me an email, and I'm more than happy to provide that to you guys. Okay, thank you. I am pretty sure that we will have a lot of questions at the end of, uh, of the session. I hope so, because I have at least uh, two questions, or even more for you. Thank you very much. It was a, really a real pleasure to, to listen to you. Uh, the second uh, speaker uh, will be um, Professor Andrew Skulian. The title of his presentation is A Biology Background and Clinical Application of the Hyaluronic acid in reconstructive periodontal surgery. Therefore, Professor Anton Skulian will be the bridge or the link from the biology to the clinic. Professor Skulian is one of the most prolific author. I think I, I don't need to introduce him too much, but uh, he currently published over than 200, 260, even more peer-reviewed articles and books. He is an excellent lecturer as well. He is also the head of the Department of uh, Paleontology of the University of Bern, and our current president of the EFP. And he is my dear friend. Please, Professor Skulian, come to stage. Thank you, Sofia the introduction and I'm very happy to um, be on the stage and share some of um, our data with you. So um, our studies were funded by uh, some grants from Bregadan and uh, I will address three topics, uh, some of the biologic background, why we started to work uh, on this topic and uh, Rick uh, elaborated very nicely on it. Uh, on the indications and uh, some clinical applications. Of course, we do not have randomized studies yet, but uh, we have some clinical interactions. <coughs> so, um, as Rick has also pointed out, uh, hyaluronic acid is, uh, in fact, uh, a very important part of um, the tissue function because, uh, in fact, during uh, the angiogenesis, uh, it played a crucial role in uh, many different uh, uh, parts of the organism. <coughs> and uh, in fact, um, you can read uh, all, this, um, all these points. I mean, it's uh, uh, acting as a promoter for early inf uh, inflammation, and uh, it uh, has an effect on revitalization. I think it's uh, very, very important. And uh, it has also an important function on uh, cell uh, migration, and even uh, some um, antimicrobial effect can be uh, observed. And uh, it was first described in uh, 1934 uh, by Carl Myers and some co-workers. And you see it was uh, isolated uh, from uh, the corpus vitreus. Uh, and uh, uh, thereafter, they had isolated it also from uh, other parts of the body. The molecule uh, has been already uh, described by um, Rick. And uh, in fact, it uh, accumulates in the extracellular uh, matrix. And uh, if you have a wound, uh, these uh, molecules accumulate, in fact, uh, during the uh, scarring uh, process. And uh, in fact, uh, it has an important effect on regulating uh, inflammation. And it uh, promotes cell migration uh, into the wound. And biologically, uh, this knowledge um, triggered 
us to perform some uh, studies because, uh, in fact, we have in mind the possible clinical applications. So, uh, as you can observe it, we uh, applied it on uh, different defects, um, in intraosseous defects, uh, and uh, in most cases on recessions. And uh, we have uh, first screened the literature together with um, uh, my colleagues, and you see the, the first two authors of this systematic review, Dr. Eliezer and Dr. Uh, Imber, who are sitting here. And uh, they did a very hard job. They screened the entire literature, and they looked up what, what is known uh, on the effects of hyaluronic acid in non-surgical therapy, in terms of probing pocket depth reduction, clinical attachment level gain, for example, if, we, if you perform a non-surgical therapy, scaling and root planing, and decrease of inflammation. Interestingly, if you use uh, hyaluronic acid in conjunction with non-surgical therapy, the um, clinical data did not show a major benefit compared to control, scaling and root planing alone. However, if we look at some other data where they uh, treated intrabony defects surgically, the results uh, looked completely different because in terms of uh, probing that reduction and clinical attachment level gain, there was a statistically significant difference. And uh, this has been demonstrated in a, a meta-analysis. So it was a huge work because they extracted all the data and we found really substantial evidence indicating a benefit uh, in uh, intrabony defects, but in a non, uh, not in a non-surgical way, in a surgical approach. So this is very important. Um, so as a conclusion, the meta-analysis uh, has for the first time demonstrated <coughs> that uh, there's not much clinical benefit when we use uh, hyaluronic acid as an objective to non-surgical therapy. However, if we use it in conjunction with an open flap debridement uh, in an intrabony defect, we may additionally improve the clinical outcomes. We can also criticize that we still don't have histologic evidence for periodontal regeneration if we use uh, hyaluronic acid, but uh, I think clinically the data <coughs> are quite uh, interesting. And then we uh, performed also some laboratory studies, and this is a, a study uh, that uh, is under revision uh, with our group. And uh, in fact, we used two different formulations. Uh, these are the two products. One was a, a native non-crosslinked uh, hyaluronic acid, and uh, the other one is the uh, cross-linked hyaluronic acid. So uh, in fact, uh, both <laughs> combinations are available for clinical use. And in fact, uh, we uh, tested these uh, effects on gingival fibroblasts. So not on periodontal ligament fibroblasts, but on gingival fibroblasts, because in fact, we would like to use them also for soft tissue regeneration. And uh, uh, we have, uh, in fact, um, uh, collagen type 1 and uh, TGRP1. Uh, and uh, these uh, um, molecules have an uh, increased expression in scar tissue and also in fibrosis. Collagen uh, type 3 and uh, TGF beta 3 are uh, abundant during fetal development. So in fact, it's a kind of uh, a very, very old molecules. And uh, they are indicators of uh, scarless wound healing. And uh, if you look now at uh, the various uh, results that we have, so we have uh, the two different formulations. And uh, look at the uh, expression of uh, different uh, um, of, uh, different growth factors like TGFB3 and uh, the collagen 3 a one So if we look, for example, at um, uh, the controls and the two formulations, we you see some uh, uh, differences. And uh, if we go uh, now um, on the expression of genes encoding growth factors in primary um, uh, cells, we can see differences between the control, you see, and the two formulations, the crosslink <coughs> and the non-crosslink. The crosslink was a little bit more efficient compared to the uh, non-crosslink one, but in fact the differences were not, not major. But you can see the difference between the black bar and the two other bars is uh, statistically uh, significant, indicating an effect uh, of uh, both uh, formulations. 
If we look now at the stimulation of pro-inflammatory cytokine expression, uh, we uh, have also an effect on uh, palatal fibroblasts and also on uh, gingival fibroblasts because we harvested fibroblasts from different uh, parts of the oral cavity. Usually we harvest connective tissue graft, uh, for example, from the palate, and uh, we use it for recession coverage, but we have also uh, some cases where we uh, excise the gingiva. And again, if you look at the differences between the uh, two formulations and the control, you can see, again, a <coughs> huge uh, difference indicating an effect of this uh, material. And if you look now uh, on the granulation uh, uh, tissue and on uh, remodeling by MMPS, <coughs> again, we see the differences. We see the two formulations and if you look it in, the, uh, in comparison with the control, again, you can see in every single site um, difference. For example, if you look at uh, MMP1, if you look at uh, MMP2, MMP3, and if uh, we look at uh, MMP8. So we have a, a profound effect on the cytokine uh, production and on the inflammatory uh, reaction. And uh, the two uh, AJ formulation are not likely to contribute to any negative effects. So in fact, we were not able to see any um, deterrence effect on, 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 on cells that contribute to the wound healing. And this is also in line what uh, Dr. Uh, Myron said before. So in fact, uh, we didn't see uh, any uh, cell uh, death on our experiments. And uh, now if you look at um, uh, again, at uh, MMP1, MMP2, if you look at ER1, uh, alpha, beta, TNF alpha, you see again the differences. So uh, this is, of course, also depending on the concentration, but in fact, uh, all uh, results pointed to an effect uh, that may trigger uh, the wound healing. So in summary, what we can say about the biology <coughs> of this uh, uh, material we can say that it is uh, fully biocompatible. It uh, did not uh, exert any negative effect on the viability of cells, uh, neither on uh, gingival fibroblast nor on uh, palatal fibroblast. It promoted cell proliferation, it promoted cell migration, and of course, it had an effect on uh, the so-called scarless wound healing. That means that uh, we may have a faster wound healing with less scar tissue, and uh, it, is, uh, um, it appears to be important on uh, proper wound healing. It uh, also played a role uh, in the initiation of cellular inflammatory uh, response. And uh, if we look now again uh, on the two formulations, you see the different cell types, and we compare it to the control, you see the time of proliferation, so we have an, a faster proliferation rate of those uh, cells. <coughs> and uh, you can see the same again. You see here some example of the cells uh, tre uh, treated with two different formulations. Look, uh, the amount of cells uh, compared to the control is uh, clearly uh, visible. So what is now the clinical relevance? Where could we use it? So we started to use it in um, uh, the treatment of uh, difficult recessions, especially in the um, large or mandibular recessions, single and multiple recessions. Uh, this kind of cases, you see this is a, a case of a Miller class, uh, let's say, if you take the old classification, we can term it as three because we have some loss of the pa uh, papilla. And uh, we all know that these uh, large recessions are quite difficult to treat. So usually I prefer to use a kind of bio material that will uh, have the wound healing. We do not have uh, uh, keratinized tissue at, uh, attached gingiva, and we have some, uh, uh, some frenula inserting. What uh, uh, we do in most cases, we are preparing a full thickness uh, panel. It is not a split thickness, it's full thickness in order to reduce the possibility of uh, perforation. And uh, we extend the tunnel mesially and distally we release the fibers that are uh, uh, in fact uh, inserting uh, in, this, in this flap. 
And you can see that uh, with this so-called naturally closed tunnel technique that was published uh, two weeks ago uh, with uh, um, uh, Pat Allen together in 24 cases, we can see that we may approach uh, the edges of the moon quite easily. <coughs> of course, <coughs> we use a biologic material like connective tissue graft and uh, and then we apply the hyaluronic acid in the womb. And what uh, has uh, uh, surprised me when I use it for the first time is this picture. You see, when you place the material on, on a root surface and you have bleeding, the, the blood was like, um, like, like stabilizing, like a kind of blood clot that became stable on this avascular surface. And you can, this is a typical picture of application of the application of uh, AJ. And this is uh, in line with what uh, Dr. Myro said before, because we had seen uh, this uh, effect on the dentin slabs. And uh, of course, then we place the connective tissue graft because we need some cells. I usually apply another layer of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, AJ. And then we close the tunnel with single sutures. It's very simple, like uh, uh, approaching the edges. And then we, okay, now I hope that it, yeah. And you observe the healing approximately uh, six months later, no scar tissue formation, and we have uh, a very nice uh, coverage. So we have treated now, I think we have about 30 cases, and uh, Dr. Eliezer will present the poster uh, tomorrow. So you are welcome to look at uh, the data. And uh, this is another case. So again, a quite uh, challenging situation. And again, the same approach. Separation of a full thickness uh, tunnel, releasing the fibers. You see, we approach the edges of the wood and we place the hyaluronic acid. And uh, this is in fact uh, the only material that had this clinical appearance. You can clearly see it that the, uh, the blood clot appears to be more stable on this root surface. And uh, this, is, was, this was, in fact, the clinical feeling that I had. Of course, it's not uh, a randomized study. Uh, there are clinical cases. And again, the combination with the uh, connective tissue graft and the application of another layer of hyaluronic acid. We can even leave some part of the connective tissue graft exposed. This is the big advantage of the autogenous tissue, and uh, we have uh, uh, the healing. And please observe, we don't have any scar uh, tissue formation, indicating a quite uh, positive <coughs> result. There's another case, this is an upper jaw case. You see a Miller class um, summit one, preparation of the tunnel, and uh, we mobilize the tunnel completely. I never use uh, vertical releasing incisions, uh, and uh, then again, the application of hyaluronic acid, and you see again and again, always the same clinical picture. The <laughs> blood clot appears to be more stable, use of connective tissue graft, and uh, then the tunnel is moved coronally with a single uh, sling suture. And we wait about for about uh, two weeks, and we remove the sutures. And this is uh, the outcome. Please observe a complete coverage, and we have a stable clinical situation. So if you look now at uh, the data that will be, uh, be presented uh, tomorrow, uh, in the meantime, we have uh, 15 more patients, and the results uh, look really promising. So we included uh, 15 patients with a total of 25 uh, uh, buccal recessions, Miller class one, two, and three. And, uh, in fact, what we obtained, it was 90% complete root coverage at six months. So almost every single case was uh, uh, completely covered, indicating a positive effect on the wound healing. And uh, in conclusion, what I can tell you today is that uh, the use of uh, this material in conjunction with peronta surgery appears to improve uh, peronal uh, wound healing. Whether this is now a histologic regeneration we don't know yet, but uh, we would like to get more information about that. It has to be demonstrated. We don't know what is happening on the root surface, whether we have new cementum, peronta ligament, eventually a new bone. 
But uh, what we know nowadays that is, is that the wound healing itself is faster, we have less scar tissue formation, and we have a very nice aesthetic outcome. And um, for sure we will have some uh, aspects to discuss uh, after the three lecture. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lesbina, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Once again, um, I uh, promise you that we are going to jump to the future. And now you can uh, really understand why I started with it, these words. Now, let's uh, not to lose too much time. I, um, I want to introduce Professor Piloni. And uh, he, will, uh, he will share with us his uh, clinical experience on the, the use of hyaluronic acid uh, for recession coverage with a coronary, a coronary advanced uh, technique. Um, now, Professor Piloni is the head of the... Uh, this is right in the middle of the presentation. Yeah, uh, please pay attention to the presentation of Professor Piloni because he is not Bring up slide one. started yet. And um, in the meantime, I will introduce Professor Piloni. Professor Piloni is the head of the department of uh, periodontal in, uh, in Rome, in Rome, in Sapienza University. And what he told me uh, before that uh, he is extremely pleased to share with you his experience because uh, he is going back to his uh, first lab. It was the hyaluronic acid. Professor Piloni, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Chairman, for the nice presentation. Uh, she was uh, relating to my first love in biology because I, I went to speak to Dr. Carranza at UCLA in 1989 for my postgraduate program, my master's degree in oral biology. And I asked him if I could uh, run my thesis on hyaluronic acid and the implantal tissue. So that was 29 years ago. And he said, uh, why not? You should try. And by the way, he asked me uh, to become his friends on Facebook two weeks ago. Uh, he's 92, he's still my mentor. Uh, this is uh, something, of course, that uh, uh, brings me back uh, so many years ago. And I want to express my thanks to the uh, organizing committee for giving me the, the chance to, uh, for some reason, explain, try to explain the uh, biology behind what we have done with the uh, Gingival study. On the patient side, we talk about 90% of adults that show some sort of recessions. Uh, and uh, on the clinical aspect, we look, look at not only to the uh, exposure of the roots, but also to some lack of tissue. Uh, meaning that we looked at gingival margin, to depth of sulcus, and most of the time to the mucogingival line uh, to say that uh, uh, for some reason there is a loss of uh, attached gingiva. So the clinician looks at the coverage of the root, but also to the increase of tissue. And so mucogingival surgery is bringing uh, to the hands uh, of the uh, periodontists and general practitioners some sort of options to solve these problems. <coughs> oh, where did I keep red? Okay. The options are so many, but today we look at the combination of uh, CAF, coronally advanced flap method, and the use of HA. Give me something. So coronally advanced flap is becoming uh, lately, uh, and thanks to Massimo De Santis, of course, that is right here, uh, something useful for our patients. And there are several papers that uh, explained how predictable this method can be in the short and the long run. Um, we uh, have looked at several of those, and I uh, think that one of the, or those that really uh, mm, impressed me the most was this by Sandro and Gianni Prado. 
because they uh, try to put together CAS and clinical strategies uh, combining uh, uh, something else with uh, the CAS method. Uh, in 2006, with Paolo Camargo, that now is the chairman of PERI at UCLA, replacing Fermin Carranza, we looked at the use of EMD uh, combined to the CAS. Um, and we were kind of uh, happy to see that something was changing. But in this paper by Sandra and Gianni Pini Prato, you see that by the time you, you combine something to CAS, there is something changing uh, uh, with the best, saying that there is uh, an increase of uh, KT, uh, cost benefit, uh, great stability, aesthetics, and etc. So there must be some uh, intention to treat uh, by combining uh, those two things together. And why HA? I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Myron and Tony Spulian have done already <laughs> what they could have done. Uh, in terms of saying that this molecule has a lot to do with healing. And that's me to the right side. You can tell that's only a few years ago, but that's <laughs> actually 1992 when I discussed my thesis on neurobiology, showing that there was an effect on a of HA into the bone cells. We looked at the uh, differentiation of mesenchymal cells in vitro, and uh, he's right, Myron, saying that uh, if you combine HA and cells and some medium for osteogenesis, you see uh, cell confluence, cell confluence and formation of calcified tissue. So we were interested in pursuing this, and I want to thank my mentor, the chairman of the oral biology department, George Bernard, that really uh, was with me uh, all throughout my studies. So cementum, PDL, and bone, and HA. Um, very few of us know that PDL and the humor vitreous are the only adult tissues that have very high concentration of hyaluronic acid. Because normally hyaluronic acid is into fetal tissues. That's why fetuses do not create scars if you do fetal surgeries. <coughs> Up to the seven month, eight month of gestation, no fetuses develop a scar. And the only two adult tissues that harbor, that harbor so much HA are the eye and the PDL environment. That, this is why in 1988, Newman and Berkowitz were calling PDL a fetal like tissue. Chemical structure, you know, it's a non sulfated glycosaminoglycan. It's the only glycosaminoglycan that has no uh, sulfate groups around. That's a reason for that. But another time. <laughs> this is into chemistry. And it's into healing, it's into cell migration and many, uh, many uh, biological circumstances. So see the, the molecule of HA compared to collagen, uh, fibrinogen, albumin, gamma globulin. It's huge. So huge that one gram absorbs three liters of water. So it has to do with some ingrowth of things like fluids, liquids, and cells. And look at the 90s. I mean, the 90s were so productive in terms of looking at HA at different um, stages of healing, <coughs> morphogenesis, tissue repair, fracture sites. Our group uh, at UCLA with Dr. Bernard, calcification with Bolsky and fetal surgery. I mean, fetal surgery is a place where HA is everywhere. <coughs> to make a long story very short, Blood clot formation, stabilization, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. Let's look at this one. I mean, we go back in the 60, uh, 1965 to see that granulation tissue becomes very solid and, and stable in, in combination of HA. That's 53 years ago. By the way, in 1964, I was born 54 years ago. So this is 53 years old. And we have uh, paid, uh, journals like Science that were interested in HA and angiogenesis. We have uh, so many data on granulation tissue, granulation tissue and uh, clot formation. Uh, Myron is right, it's, it's, he was back into the 90s, but yes, we have so many uh, data that go back in the 70s, 60s, and, and so many years ago. It's a vehicle for, for peptide growth factors, he's right. But that's 1992. 
and uh, that is a this is a very strong journal so it's almost everywhere when it comes to early healing <clears throat> and this is myself again with professor bernard at ucla when we wanted to look at pdl cells and osteoforming medium and again pdl cells could calcify on the petri dish <coughs> And thanks to this wonderful group of people, as you've seen, HA and PDL seems to have a, a very strong potent effect. Uh, very few before 1996, 97, up to 99, were aware of the fact that HA is also an antiseptic effect, but it's a bit more or so is ba a bacteriostatic effect uh, when it's mixed to. Uh, anaerobes and we've been able to publish this paper with a group of Gulevi Muniski. He was the chairman of Biochemistry of Saliva at UCLA. So this is actually the very first time when you could think of the use of HA into the oral cavity like uh, as a treatment because before then everyone was convinced that uh, it could help bacteria to grow <laughs> because it helps cells to grow. Why not bacteria? They're very similar. So back to this uh, issue of the adults, we, as a recapitulation, can see uh, a conclusion like this. Stimulates calcification PDL cells, has a bacteriostatic effect, enhances soft wound healing, and inhibits scar formation. Uh, before going into our study, thanks to Dr. Schoolian, uh, let me briefly spend a few minutes on periodontal wounds. We are the ones creating wounds. Wounds are created by surgeons, and thank God we save people's lives sometimes by creating wounds. And in perio, they're very different, but they are wounds. Periodontal wounds are different, but uh, if you belong to the Wound Healing Society, and if you read their definition of wound healing or definition of the wound, it's so interesting because you would uh, hit something that is very uh, strange because they talk about due to external violence or some mechanical agency rather than disease and this is why when you see wonderful healing after Massimo De Santis uh, surgeries it's because he's treating healthy tissues it's a definition that relates to healthy tissues it's not a disease <clears throat> let's jump into some the biology of our periodontal tissues, uh, epithelial cells, epithelial layers, and connective tissues. So if we look at the epithelial compartment, uh, which is very different from the connective tissue compartment, I mean, epithelial cells are everywhere. Everywhere in the intestine, the lungs, skin, everywhere. But we know that epithelial tissues are only 3% of the human body weight, 3%. It's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, but it's like uh, not consistent compared to others, like the connective tissue. <clears throat> but the role of these epithelial cells is very important when you create a wound because keratinocytes are the first cell line that hit the wound to close. I mean, we need keratinocytes. Those are the cells that we describe like dead cells over the skin, but they have to run, they have to rush into the area, otherwise the healing is impaired. And there are friends that are capable of creating artificial tissue, like, uh, you know, the lasagne, layer by layer over the petri dish. This is a fake gingival tissue that you can create over the petri dish, and you can cut with a blade. So I spent a few weeks with my friend Phil Stevens at the University of Cardiff. He's the chairman of a postgraduate program in wound healing, the only one in Europe, two-year program. So he tells to me, if you create a, a lasagna type of a fake epithelial tissue or a petri dish and you cut with a 15C blade, you can read their messages between those cells until they reach a closure. And those cells reach a closure without blood, without interleukins, without immune cells. I mean, they're alone, but they are doomed, deemed to <laughs> go there and close. So this is the story behind epithelial cells. This is not uh, a suturing method. So what is the relationship between this and HA? Let's go into the 
um, a, a connective tissue compartment, which is down below there, that is very popular right now, right? The connective tissues seem to be uh, very useful for the healing and for the aesthetics. <coughs> well, into the connective tissue, you can find fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. And myofibroblasts are mechanically active cells. So they're like cells that close the wound. They try to <laughs> stretch the, the something to close the wound. So fibroblasts in wound healing are important and we can measure the force generation of those particular cells. So when you create a wound, there's something very unique that happens between those epithelial cells and fibroblasts. So there is a, a paracrine loop. A paracrine loop means that the keratinocytes from, uh, from there, oh my God, what happened? Uh, from the surface, send signals to the connective tissue compartment. Fibroblasts change themselves and differentiate into my fibroblasts, and there is a loop. And this loop is guaranteed by the presence of the extracellular matrix there, which is hyaluronic acid and many others. So I asked the um, Department of Regenerative Medicine at my school, Sapienza, which is the biggest school in the country, by the way, uh, to measure the force generation of my fibroblasts. And what we found in vivo with the ethical committee approval, it's something like this. So we took biopsies 24 hours after the wound, after the surgery, and looked at the myofibroblast production of those areas. And it's interesting because in 24 hours, the uh, dark bars are 24 hours uh, myofibroblast into the mucosa, okay? So there is a high production of myofibroblast into the mucosa, where you see the scar formation most of the time. And now, look at the attached gingiva. The attached gingiva seems not to, not to produce my fibroblast like mucosa, that's why we don't see that much scar formation. So this is the loop at 24 hours. There is a signal from the epithelial cells back down to the fibroblast, my fibroblast enclosure, no scar formation, HA is there. This is why we are very much interested in this early healing. <coughs> and there was actually a paper in 2009 by a fantastic group um, in Cardiff uh, that found out that HA, like Myron said, orchestrates DGF beta for the phenotype for the myofibroblast. So there is something to this nice healing that we can speed up and, uh, and improve by the use of this gel. <coughs> so again, CAF and something next to it, differently from, from EMD, from amylogenin. <coughs> Amylogenin doesn't like blood. I mean, when you apply amylogenin, you should be <coughs> safe by drying up the area, drying up the roots, not to have interference by blood with the healing. Actually, with the healing that is helped by EMD. This is what HA loves. I mean, I've been into ironic acid 29 years, and whereas, where I found HA, there was blood, for sure. So. Um, if I put together this information, I see that probably we, we have something in our hands, something that has been around for more, almost a century that can uh, accomplish several tasks. One is the blood clot, and Tony is very much right. Uh, the, the nice thing that happens with, uh, with HA, uh, by the time it touches blood, the blood becomes like sticky, stable, doesn't move and keeps growing into this gel. So uh, blood clot stabilization and blood clot um, protection is the first line into the properties of hyaluronic acid or hyaluronic acid, besides the regulation of inflammation or proliferation and tissue remodeling. So you see that the blood is helped by that. And of course, in between cells, for those that are into uh, cell culturing, you should think of something. That is not a gray space. That is a great gray space, which is filled up with, you know, growth factors that are helped by the extracellular matrix environment, including hyaluronic acid. That's why HA supports the cell proliferation, and we should talk about different molecular weights, the importance of the molecular weights, 
but this is not probably the right place to speak about it, but that is important. Then maybe what uh, my friend Donny Skugan is, is was talking about in, in the infrabony lesion uh, topic, we should see more movement of cells when it comes to the use of this type of gel. So thanks to our wonderful group, to Philip Sardman, to Mariana Rocas from Buenos Aires, and to Skulian, and Patrick Schmidlin, we could think of a first long term in, in 18 months uh, use of HA in RT1 three sessions, plus one meter, meter plus one. And what we found uh, it, it was that we, yes, in a statistically significant uh, way, we could prove a higher recession reduction, uh, cal gain, percentage of group coverage, but not too much difference with control in terms of PD and KT. One thing that we've done, and then we go uh, very fast, it was also a BAS analysis. And, and yes, patients uh, uh, could uh, experience something much easier compared to control. <coughs> control. So control and test very quickly. Um, this is a typical uh, recession that we look at. Of course, we have to analyze if it's right to define this as a class meal, a class one, or a RT1 in terms of amount of a, a, um, attached gingiva. This is the exposure of the root, the full thickness, the split thickness, forgive me, Massimo is not very right in saying things, but my, my, my bimodulator now is HA, and HA, if you leave it there for two minutes, I mean, shows you something. That is what we would go for in terms of blood health for the healing, the stability of this blood. Uh, coronally uh, positioning the flap with a passive uh, action, no tension, and this is the before, this is the after. There is no increase in, in KT uh, after our study, but the healing was very, very uh, important and very nice compared to the uh, test. With uh, one year follow-up, this is the, uh, the pictures. Another uh, case, very quickly. Um, eight minutes and 20 seconds to show you this type of one, uh, one single uh, recession type of defect. This is the way Giovanni Zucchelli wants to show you the roots. Well, I'll try to do the same, just to tell you that you wait one and two minutes, three minutes, and you would see almost the blood running through and into this, um, this gel that you uh, apply over the root. I mean, of course, that happens all the time. Two, three minutes, it's there. Then you coronally advance the flap. And uh, this is the healing, the before and after. I should have another case very quickly. Exposure of the roots, the HA of the roots, the advancement of the flap. And this is 24 hours. Uh, but one of my uh, students in dental school, um, and now is in the master program, is looking at 24 hours healing types of healing uh, for uh, several uh, surgeries with HA, and this is what we see most of the time. This is the eight month, 18 months healing. Again, uh, multiple recession types of defect, the before and after. <coughs> okay, so as a conclusion, we can um, conclude like this. Uh, the CAF of coronally advanced flap with the health of use or use of HA is a predictable and safe method for a single, sorry, RT1 gingival recession site treatment. These findings uh, indicate that the use of HA may not only improve the clinical results, but also represent an option to reduce patient morbidity. And we want to emphasize this post-ops, the early healing, which is very much helped by the use of HA. The reason why the people at uh, Sapienza Barrier Group have the polo shirt yellow and red is because the city of Rome is yellow and red. It's nothing to do with the soccer team. Well, yeah, well, yes, but uh, don't tell anyone. Thank you for your
for your wonderful presentation. If I, uh, before, I, before we start with the questions, what um, there are, um, according yes, to my uh, understanding of your presentation, there are three issues we have to keep in mind. First, according, I am clinician. The bacteriostatic effect of the HA, the positive effect on the wound healing potential in patients with the compromised wound healing potential, and uh, the effect of reducing the scar tissue. But what I want to ask you, if according to you, really, it's uh, the HA is the biomaterial of the future, and if so, give me your opinion about that. Also, I have uh, some questions about the clinical utilization of the HA. I don't know who, who is uh, want to come first. It is the biomaterial of the future. Dr. Myron. Dr. Myron. Only the future will tell us if it is the biomaterial of the future. According to you, please, uh, Tony, come because I have uh, some questions. Yeah. 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 Way to put me on the spot. It's good. Um, you know, we've done a lot of research with a lot of different biomaterials. And uh, the more and more research that I do, the more and more I find that uh, each material is specific for a certain indication. Um, personally, I think that what Dr. Schoolian said related to seeing whether or not HA can really form true periodontal regeneration and show this histologically, I think this is a really big missing piece of information, uh, and it's one that we commented on in the book chapter without question. When it comes to soft tissue wound healing, though, the clinical effects look you know, pretty good when you see some of these cases. I don't know if you want to comment on it. Yeah. I think, I think um, that we have a biologic background for this material, definitely. I don't think that we can, we will be able to use only this material itself. I think it needs to be combined with different other approaches, as Rick uh, started to say. But we need data on the wound healing as evidence histologically. So we need some animal models showing, for example, what is happening on a, on a, a recession. If you perform a root coverage procedure with a coronal advanced flap and applying uh, AJ, uh, and uh, I would like to see whether I have a cemento, peronta, ligament, and bone, or maybe a long junction epithelium, I don't know. And then I would like to validate this also in an intrabony defect, in an animal model, and maybe some human histology. And if I have these pieces of information, I can tell you more uh, uh, evidence based. What, what I could understand from, uh, from uh, Professor Pironi's presentation that uh, this biomaterial is extremely known. I can add. Yeah. Um, I was very happy when uh, my Rich Miner said that if something new is around, it requires so many years to become uh, useful in the clinical application. But on the other hand, if we look at HA, if this thing has 80 more years or is 100 years old or something like that, yeah. and they need to be medical field, the regenerative field, the uh, aesthetic medicine, it's uh, very much into the hands of the clinicians and the biologists. So I agree with them. So we need to know on the histological level what happens with soft and hard tissues together. Number two, there is a, a tricky point into the molecular weight because I've been proving that low molecular weight, meaning 160,000 kilodalton, is useful for mesenchymal cells to become bone cells. But on the other hand, the application of HA in the clinical use is more into the uh, high molecular weight. So uh, we have to wait uh, uh, a little bit more, unfortunately. Yeah, so but we, uh, how do you decide the, uh, the cross-link or non-cross-link um, use of the HA? Well, uh, I'm not saying that we're not uh, understanding what is best, because probably the, into the high molecular weight there is the application. But we have to, to, to work as clinicians more uh, as much as we can. But, uh, but if you ask me yeah. if I'm happy, of course I am, because I've been trying all kinds of uh, uh, you know, forms of HA, and uh, Sasha Jovanovic with the implants, 
uh, has been trying HA and DNP and sponges of HA. I mean, there is a lot of uh, action, but uh, we need uh, to, to prove clinically what happened. And my feeling is that uh, early healing is really helped by this, uh, this extracellular medicine. What I understood that uh, Professor Gaspurian is uh, combining with uh, connective tissue glass pulsation coverage, and you uh, you can use uh, without just combining with a coronary advanced club. Yes. And how do you use clinically that uh, if you have to give as an advice practically? I mean, uh, most of my cases are laboratory cases, and in these cases, we need also to have some. Uh, tissue or, or some, some graft that will increase the tissue thickness and will enhance uh, wound stability. So that's why I use a, a connective tissue graft because we can also leave it exposed in certain cases. And uh, in fact, the first layer is always on the root surface uh, hyaluronic acid because this will create a kind of uh, uh, stable blood clot as we have seen it in uh, our yes, uh, very nicely. Um, cases. And then uh, we place the connective tissue graft on the root surface, we fix it, and of course we have some remnants of the material, yeah. we can place another layer on the connective tissue and onto the flap. But when do you harvest the connective tissue graft? Yeah. Do you put also uh, HA over uh, it or we, not? We, we can I use it, place it in a small okay. vial, and exactly. the, you can either place it saline or HA. I, this I don't know. You don't and know. The most Just important is that, is that the connective it. tissue shouldn't dry out. But uh, of course. I think, I think uh, uh, theoretically, why not? Usually, if I work with endogate, okay. I also exactly. put endogate That's connective why tissue. So we can do exactly the same with the HA. Uh, and the root surface must be dry or not? No, I, I didn't dry it. Exactly. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't, not I didn't, have I didn't, I didn't take care of uh, any of these aspects. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I didn't dry it. Um, I didn't uh, take care that we don't have uh, blood contamination as we have to do it with other products, for example, with uh, endogame. And uh, if you are, um, for example, you are trained to use endogame in these situations and you use HA, uh, clinically you will see the difference because with endogame everything is difficult to see, everything is flushing out. And with yeah. HA, uh, you have a completely other clinical situation that the, the blood is getting more stable and you have a kind of uh, clot-like formation on the root surface. So this was my clinical impression. Whether this is now clinically relevant or not, this is another point of discussion. This I don't know. But uh, the wound healing after one week and two weeks uh, is in uh, most cases, in every case, in fact, that I treated, I treated about 30 cases consecutively, is, it was uh, always uh, very, very nice. And for you, in your everyday practice, do you use, in all clinical situations, polarization coverage? Not in all cases, but uh, as uh, we <laughs> said, showing our experience, uh, when there is the patient that looks not prone to heal like we would like, why not? And especially if we have yeah. uh, systemically involved uh, patients. people, yeah. patients that of course, you know, we're not only talking about diabetes, I'm not control diabetes patients, but those that need some help, you know, why not? Mm -hmm. They do it in the medical field, why not the this? So I think that um, it can be an agent that we can implement, of course. Um, whether we should use it in every s clinical case, I, I don't know, but I think uh, it doesn't harm. That's the most important point. That the first yeah. is it shouldn't harm, and of exactly. course, it is if it implements I mean, patient acceptance and the early wound healing. Uh, I think this is a benefit for a patient. Okay, but yeah, the yeah, most of important of course. in difficult cases, yeah. the most important is a connective tissue. Huh? It allows you. Uh, yeah. The difficult case, but I mean, certain biologic agents may additionally improve the wound healing. But in my cases, I cannot get rid of the connective tissue. I mean, that's that's the the surgical technique and the connective tissue graft are the most important. And then, of course, some you biologic mean, agents may additionally give some. You some mean support. the flap design when you are talking about surgical technique? Yes, flap design, flat, not the flap also, but also tension-free yeah. working to release the flap to. 
counter muscles whatsoever. I mean, especially in the Lao Tzu cases, this is an important aspect. Yeah, you wanted to add something? No, uh, again, to what uh, Dr. Myron said regarding the diabetic patient, I mean, if you look at the uh, meetings of the Wound Healing Society, uh, the worst, the most difficult uh, wound to close is the diabetic ulcer. So they try to do their best to close those wounds. And diabetic patients need some help. So why not? Yeah, <laughs> I, just, uh, I don't know if uh, from the audience uh, there is some question. Well, I would like to ask a couple of questions if I can. Yeah, of course. you can. So bright and brilliant people. It is interesting, the yeah. idea. Can you take the microphone? Do yeah. I have a microphone? Yes. Oh. I have to move, but you yeah. know. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Bring it to you. We can bring it to you. No problem. I will try this. Massimo, you have only two hours. You hear me? Yes. Later. Only two hours. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm just giving a short comment. Okay. So what? No, I'm interested because I was very excited when I found out that you do so many room coverage on diabetic people. It is funny to know that you have so many diabetic young people doing room coverage. In any event, it is something that may help. No, but the question said that he was doing on diabetic. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I said no, Joe. I'm talking about Dr. Pitoni. Dr. Pitoni is the victim of this question. So let me ask the first question. Let me ask you why. No, this stage, that I, I, I appreciate that you have chosen the neurogingival surgery or the, uh, uh, those techniques to cover the roots, one way or another. Uh, as, as a, a way to experiment the value of this uh, uh, new uh, material. By the way, it's always, I'm always happy to find a new material that can implement my result. But the question is, which is the research aspect of this? Because it seems to me that by the, the data we have, even from Dr. Scullian, we get more than 95% of coverage without using it. So why you choose this kind of technique and not, for instance, a one-wall inframolly different where nobody can do anything? just to see if you have some implement in the biological situation, because then the differential, plus you're talking about something that doesn't have a differential for the moment, no? so we don't have any test and control. So which way would you like to test this stuff in a, uh, in a, a neurogenital environment to find out if there is an adding value on a clinical standpoint? Because you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that you have a lot of cells that are very excited at the beginning. The point is what happened after. And the final part is, yes, you may find out this allows you that you get uh, new attachment, uh, genetic tissue attachment or new bone or new ligament. But we know that 15 years later, just with this uh, very funny small surgery, we can have a stability of the cells. So it seems to be a little bit too much to look for uh, a different biological environment only on this. Probably maybe that uh, you should concentrate a little bit on infrabony. I would be very happy to find out that uh, a one wall defect or a zero wall defect will become completely healed by utilizing ammonia acid. Uh, just uh, as a question. Plus, the question? The, the, the victim, question is this. The victim is ready. I give you, okay. I give you the response. <laughs> but I'm so excited about this. I'm going to have to give an answer. Thank very you. quick. Thank you. As a victim, <laughs> very quick. And, uh, let me answer to the question number two. We have almost concluded the infrabony defects. The almost. With, uh, always. I have always in the almost No, position. because the statistician is running the uh, statistics. So okay. we have to put together the data and see what of course, we are. We have been looking at the uh, beneficial effect of stabilizing the clot into the infrabony area, with and without, uh, with or without the grafting material, with the membranes. Only HA alone and HA plus a graft material in the sandwich fashion, sandwich dipping fashion, like the natural base. To answer to your first question regarding, would you use into for all your recession patients uh, HA? Well, right now I have to. What was that the question? No, it was me. It was me. The question because for that. I yeah. need to 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 gain data on the long run because, of course, uh, I'm happy for the uh, post ops. Post ops are really nice, and on the patient side, this might not be uh, the only critical part, but it's sometimes critical for them. Uh, but I agree with you. If, uh, if the control might be might look the same. Yes, but we need more data. I agree mean, I mean with Tony. We need to put together. But, but uh, regarding your question about uh, intrabody defects, mm -hmm. you remember I started my presentation with a systematic review. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the data indicates that we have a benefit. So let's five, five, five randomized controlled studies. <laughs> I will send you the paper. 
But the question was not questioning that. So why did you, you were okay. so excited at the same thing a double <laughs> tunnel technique yeah. instead of uh, uh, infraboli in patients? Yeah. My question that I saw a lot of mucoginger it was beautiful, yeah. but I was asking myself which is the result that you are looking for on a mucoginger at Pastor, what do you What do you mean? Three days, four days, five like days? No, I mean uh, in terms of early wound healing, the first okay. weeks. I see that uh, and then the improved patient acceptance because I uh, probably will not get a big statistically significant difference uh, after six months or one year. But uh, it is a benefit for a patient if you have uh, faster wound healing, uh, less postoperative complications. This is, this is, I mean, increases patient acceptance, that's it. I mean, uh, and maybe after six months you don't see a difference, but even these two weeks uh, are for many patients an improvement. Fantastic. And just also, you mentioned, you mentioned just the uh, last, uh, maybe last uh, uh, comment, Tony. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you treated class three recession targeted according to the to the yes. media classification. Yes. And uh, what is your uh, experience? Maybe I have some cases with complete coverage. Complete coverage yes. in even in class three recession yes. target effects, lower term. I will show you tomorrow also some cases. Uh -huh. But it's because of the surgical technique and uh -huh. the skills. And the skills. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, we, we apply in some cases, but now we, we don't have so so many cases. Maybe I have 10 cases where we applied it. So it's, it's very difficult to, to say. Maybe we need to do in that aspect a real control, uh, control study. There is a randomized yeah. control trial on that. And the show. Amazing. Go to the neck of the Dr. Eliezer is very well prepared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. She knows the literature, it's her thesis. <laughs> About your question, uh, yes, there is a randomized control trial. They applied on the donor side the hyaluronic acid, and they uh, compared to a donor side without hyaluronic acid. And they've seen, uh, in the um, if you take in the patient aspect, the visual analog scale was reduced tremendously. And if you see also the healing, the fa it was a faster healing. There was statistical significance in that part as well. Plus also the. Uh, the color, they also um, seen that the color is better matching when you use hyaluronic acid in the donor side compared to to the, the control side. Yes. When you have a best epithelial connective tissue grafts. Yes, from the palate. Epithelial connective tissue epithelial, grafts. Yeah. yeah, of course. So they done okay. a study on that. So uh -huh. that was <laughs> control trial. So there is, yes, please. Side effects uh, that have been uh, reported in the literature. Okay, because I was thinking actually about the patients who are suffering from cancer because hyaluronic acid increases the cell proliferation, so if it's dangerous to use it in those patients, then yes. We, we have also one very nice study also conducted by Dr. Eliezer on, uh, on uh, in diabetic rats uh, impregnating uh, uh, membrane, you can look at it, a collagen membrane and the degradation of the collagen membrane uh, was uh, slower in uncontrolled diabetic rats. But I didn't present this data because I would like her to present it at the IADR, but, uh, but this is a very nice study. So uh, especially in uncontrolled diabetic animals, it was a statistically significant difference, and uh, it was proven histologically. Thank you so much. You can add on the cancer. Yeah, add, add um, something. She wants yeah. to add about the cancer. <laughs> She's well prepared for the exam. Very good. <laughs> 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 no more exam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the examiner. <laughs> you have to prepare with uh, good, good points, lecture. So.
Uh, about uh, um, uh, system, uh, systemic uh, patients, uh, if you have uh, di diabetes or if you have uh, cancer, uh, cancer so patient with cancer, patient with uh, let's say um, uh, with um, more prob problem with sorry no, more problem uh, with blood uh, uh, blood problems. Uh, if you apply hyaluronic acid on those patients, few things happen. What, what I experience with also with my patient that uh, has uh, melodysplastic syndrome, I apply also hyaluronic acid there when there was a pool of blood coming out of this uh, uh, pocket, that it helps to stabilize the blood clot. And uh, it's also modulated the, anti, uh, the, the inflammation process. It's shown with a lot of studies that hyaluronic acid is biomodulation of the inflammatory process. That means that if the inflammatory process is very high in cancer patients, in uh, diabetic patients, control, uncontrolled uh, uh, diabetic patient, also even controlled diabetic patient, because controlled diabetic patient is, can be fluctuant. One time they are uh, in a good state of diabetic state, and one time they are in a low state. We could never uh, uh, distinguish when is the right time that the patient is in control on not control, or uncontrolled diabetic patient. So in that uh, case, uh, if you apply the hyaluronic acid, it's a uh, do Biomodulation. It means reduce the inflammatory process. It's a, as you said, it's also antibacterial. And in a patient with cancer patient, you can, there is a lot of study that actually they apply it. But of course, you need to to search which kind of cancers. As uh, if you have a, a patient with um, uh, with lots of blood blood flowing out of the pocket, and they have uh, some. In that case, I think hyaluronic acid can help to stabilize the blood clot and actually stop the bleeding. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there is, uh, from the audience, another question? If not, um, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And uh, which will be just a take home message. Just a take home message. For them. Yeah, for them, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hyaluronic acid is improving. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>